Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to chapel. Today's chapel gathering is earmarked for the 2022-2023 W.C. Dobbs Lecture. Established in 1995 by W.C. Dobbs of Mobile, Alabama, the stated, if broad, emphasis of this lectureship is applied Christianity. Today, we will fit that bill with Dr. Bill Crouch, who will be lecturing on faith, fear, fundraising. Forget failing. Wonderful title. It will be a remarkable lecture. But before introducing this year's lecture, Dr. Bill Crouch, please allow me to thank uh, the lecturers committee of the seminary comprised of Dr. Kimlin Bender, who is the chair, Dr. Andrew Arterberry, Dr. Brian Brewer, and Dr. Rebecca Pohays. We're grateful not only for their planning, but also for their hosting of Dr. Crouch uh, during these days. Would you also allow me to please say a special word of thanks to Ms. Joanne sharkey Ranofsky for her work and her support with this event. Uh, Joanne is the one who gives guidance to the Lilly-funded grant, Economic Challenges Facing Future Ministers. And under the auspices and through the generosity of this grant, uh, it has made uh, this workshop yesterday and lecture today and the meals associated with both possible. I also want to say thank you to the Truett Church Network who has lent both support and funding for Dr. Crouch's being with us. Dr. Crouch is a graduate of Wingate University, Wake Forest University, and Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Crouch is the founder and CEO of Bright Dot. Bright Dot is a, an organization that partners with clients to generate the energy and the resources necessary to lead and impact change. Before Dr. Crouch, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Bright Dot, uh, went into this work, he, was the, uh, he worked at Gardner-Webb University in Western North Carolina in the foothills of the Blue Ridge. He uh, worked for the Baptist Children's Homes of North Carolina. He worked for Carson Newman University. Uh, someone must have graduated from Carson Newman. And he was the visionary and uh, very successful president of Georgetown College. Uh, Dr. Crouch is married to Jan and the father of five adult children, and uh, they have blessed them with nine uh, grandchildren. I had not long been dean uh, at Truett when uh, Dr. Crouch uh, was very gracious and uh, helped me in uh, the initial days in coaching me and also helping me to know a little bit more about fundraising uh, than I did at the time, which was frankly nothing. Uh, we are very grateful for Dr. Crouch, for his life, for his work, and we look forward to hearing you and to learning from you uh, today, Bill. But first, Adam will lead us in a hymn, uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Welcome to chapel. We stand as we sing this morning, hymn number 48, Great is Thy Faithfulness, as we hear today's lecture on faith, fear, fundraising, forget failing. I thought this would be appropriate, so we sing with you. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As 
Thank you, Adam. To Dean Still and Kim Bender and Joanne and the committee who invited me to come and be a part of this, I thank you very much. I, in doing my research, and I realized that for many, many years this lecture has taken place and that scholars from all over have been invited to stand behind this podium for this occasion until this year, when they called and said further, this year we want to be practical and invite a practitioner to come and to speak with us. So I looked up what is a practitioner. And a practitioner is a person who has practiced in their life an art or a discipline, uh, a profession, uh, and according to the definition, it's a person of wisdom, and the wisdom comes from the accumulation of all their mistakes. Right? So I feel very, very comfortable <laughs> being the lecturer today. 1976, when I was a third year student getting my Master of Divinity degree, I enrolled in the Clinical Pastoral Education Certification Program. And I was assigned to Wake Medical School in Raleigh, North Carolina. And on the first day that we met, uh, our professor, we went through all the things that we had to do to be able to know. Then we were assigned times to be on call. And I got the short straw, and I was on call the first night. And as the professor was leaving the room, he turned to me and he said, Bill, if you get in a situation tonight and you don't know what to say, just remember the power of touch. I said, okay. So at 2 o'clock in the morning, sleeping on the, the cot in the chaplain's room, my buzzer went off. I looked down and it said, emergency, fourth floor. I got dressed real quickly. As I was running to the elevator, my heart was racing. 
because this was getting ready to be an experience I had never had before in my life. I got up to the fourth floor, it opened up. Standing at the elevator was a nurse. She started walking me down the hall and she said, I need to tell you Mrs. Philpott's 88 years old. She's gonna be dying in the next few moments. Her children are distraught. We need the chaplain to come and to calm down the situation. We get to the door, the nurses disappeared. I look into the room and there's Mrs. Philpott laying there with an oxygen mask on her face. And I walk into the room and I look at her and thinking, what do I do? Do I say a prayer? Do I read the 23rd Psalm? I don't know what to do. But I saw the two daughters at the end of the bed and they were, they were weeping. And I decided there was probably nothing I could do to help Mrs. Philpott in these last moments. So I went and sat down between the two daughters. Three chairs, the one in the middle was empty. The one on the left was crying softly. The one on the right was just staring. And the one on the left immediately said to me, Chaplain, I guess you get used to watching people die. Well, the fact that I had never seen a person die made me think about what I was going to say. And I said, well, I guess, you know, I don't think you ever get used to watching somebody die. And then the one on the right says to me, do you think our mother will get to heaven tonight? And about that time, the alarm went off, the blue light went on, and Miss Philpott stopped breathing. And the person on the left, the daughter on the left, started crying loudly, and the one on the right balled up in a ball. And all of a sudden, I did not know what to say. So simultaneously, I put my hand on the shoulder on the one on the left, and because the woman was in a rolled up in a ball on the right, I looked at her, I didn't know where to put my hand, so I put it on, my, on her knee. At which time, she started screaming. She jumped up and started jumping up and down and ran out the, out the door. The woman on the left started jumping up and down and screaming, and it scared me so bad, I jumped straight up and hit the television. And I got woozy and dizzy. And they had to get the doctor to come and take care of me in the middle of this situation, where I was the one that was called in to make the situation calm. Now, there was a good outcome. Mrs. Philpott started breathing again. And we had to go through the whole scenario five minutes later. But I could give you story after story after story of how this practitioner developed his, developed his wisdom. I'm often asked, what is a bright dot? Why did you name your company Bright Dot? Well, I'm going to give you three aha moments that will give you some insight about this. The first was the first day of my presidency of Georgetown College. It was in 1991. I went into the president's office early in the morning. I had a sense of pride and a, and a sense of humbleness, and I wanted some wisdom. And so I opened my Bible that morning as the very first thing as a college president and decided to read in the book of Proverbs. I started at verse 1, chapter 1, and started reading until I got to Proverbs 3, 27. And I read that verse and I stopped. And I said, this is from God. And it says, whenever you see someone in need and you have the power to do something, do it. I read it again. Whenever you see someone in need and you have the power to do something about it, do it. That moment, that became the theme for the rest of my life. Second story. Several years later, at our annual minister's conference, where we invited pastors from all over the state of Kentucky to come to our campus, and we would bring in big-name preachers to preach to them. I was sitting in the back because I wanted to, to, ju to jump in. I wasn't always there, but I wanted to jump in to hear this gentleman preach that I'd heard so much about. When he was through, I walked up to the front to introduce myself, but there was a whole bunch of people around and I heard him turn to Eric Fruget, who was my uh, assistant, and say to him, hey, I need somebody to take me to the airport tomorrow. And he says, it's at 4 a.m. 
And I volunteered. I said, I'll take you, I'll take you. He had no clue who I was. But at four o'clock the next morning, I pulled up at the, at the uh, hotel and picked him up and put him in my car. But there was a reason I wanted to meet with him. Because I was the president of a college that was founded in 1787. It was chartered in 1829. 99.9% .9 of our congregation, I mean our congregation of our classes were white. And I knew because of Proverbs 327 and other reasons that I was going to have to diversify our college. And I had tried all different kinds of ways to do it already and had not been successful. We were able to recruit the Cincinnati Bengals to come move their summer training camp there. And I thought having all these African-American athletes on my campus, then students would flock to come enroll. That didn't happen. I offered to pay the way for our African-American students to go get their PhDs, and I would pay it 100% if they'd come back and teach, and only one person took me up on it. So I was really struggling. How am I going to get this done? And for some reason, I felt this person might be able to help me. So as we rode to the airport, I began to pour out my frustration about not being successful. As we pulled into the airport, this visiting preacher said to me, Dr. Crouch, have you ever heard of Bishop College? I said, no. He said, it's a black HBCU Baptist college that went bankrupt in 1988, and their alums have no place to call home. As a result of that conversation, Georgetown College began reaching out to the alums of Bishop College. And pastors from across the state, across the country, Ralph West, Denny Davis, Sam Guilford, Major Jemison, David Boyd, started sending their sons to our college to create a diversity revolution on our campus. Thank you, Dr. Gregory. Third story. I was on an airplane flying across the country. I'm a multi-million miler. I always sit in an aisle. But if for some reason on this plane, the only seat I could get was by a window. Sitting next to me was a woman and next to her a gentleman on the aisle. For three hours, I listened to her talking to this gentleman about what she did. She was a PhD in educational psychology. She had been hired by the Army to train special forces how to jump out of planes in Afghanistan, knowing that when they hit the ground, they were going to be faced with Al-Qaeda with machine guns. And her job was to teach them how to control their emotions as they jumped out of that plane. When we landed in Raleigh, North Carolina, she bent down to get her book bag from underneath the seat in front of her. And I bent down and said to her, you've been talking to the wrong man the last three hours. She said, that's the greatest pickup line anybody's ever given me. I said, oh, no, no. You need to go, will you go inside this airport and give me 10 minutes to tell you about what I'm trying to do with a little company that I want to start? She did. Four weeks later, she resigned from the Army. She came to work for me, and we set out to change the way nonprofits in this country work to try to make them more efficient, to make them more effective, and to make them healthier. That's the engine behind the founding of Bright Dot. So how does this relate to a conversation about faith, fear, fundraising, forget failing? Before I start talking about the F words, let me talk to you about nonprofits. 
In the United States, there are almost 2 million nonprofits across our country. 500,000 of them are religious organizations. They employ 13 million people. That's twice the population of Arizona. 25% of all adult Americans volunteer for a nonprofit in one way or another. There are 10 million donors in 2020 who made gifts to nonprofits across the country. And there are 3.5 million paid fundraisers who work for nonprofits across the country. It's often acknowledged that the reason that a nonprofit was started, every nonprofit was started, was to fight an enemy. And we know from a fundraising perspective that when there's an enemy identified, it's the number one reason that people give spontaneously. All we have to look at is Turkey and the earthquake. Ukraine. The enemy there is pain and suffering. And people give money in order to alleviate that. You can also look at civic clubs. Rotary has given close to a billion dollars across the country to wipe out polio. Other nonprofits have raised money to, to fight disease. What does a nonprofit do? A nonprofit brings people together to solve problems and to fight enemies. A nonprofit promotes civic engagement. A nonprofit creates laboratories for learning. A nonprofit provides research to cure diseases and medical teams to apply the research. A nonprofit serves those that cannot serve themselves. And a nonprofit becomes an economic engine for the areas where they're located. What would Waco be without Baylor? All of us here today have a connection with a nonprofit. You might be like me. I was born in a hospital, a nonprofit hospital in Louisville, Kentucky, when my dad was a student at Southern Seminary. You might have avoided a, a disease because a civic club gave money to help tackle diabetes. Most of us have attended church since we could crawl. Again, like me, some of you learn how to swim at the YMCA, or you learn life skills at Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, or GAs and RAs, if anybody can remember what those are. Hopefully all of us voted in November due to the fact that they're nonprofits fighting for voting rights across our country. All of us have, been to, have visited historic treasures like zoos and museums, and we've stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon. And all of us have rejoiced and laughed and had fun at productions, theater, musical that are provided by nonprofits. As quoted by the National Council of Nonprofits website, nonprofits feed, lead, shelter, educate, nurture, and inspire people of every age, gender, race, and socioeconomic status. There's no question that we desperately need nonprofits, but we need them to be healthy, well managed, and vital. So, what is the state of nonprofits in our country? At Bright Dot, I have 23 members of my team, and we've worked with what, over 100 nonprofits in the last seven years. These organizations have ranged from two employees to 2,000 employees. We love our work. We're inspired by the people who share their lives and invest their lives in doing this important work. But what is happening? Let's look at churches. In a series of articles in the Washington Post in 2022, they reported churches are declining in rapid numbers, especially Christian and Catholic churches across our country. Many are saddled with debt and have old buildings that are money pits. There are increased requests 
from all different kinds of nonprofits competing for the money that has been given to churches in the past. Many young, couple, many young people and couples have many demands on their time and do not want to go to worship services at 11 o'clock because there's so many other activities scheduled on a Sunday these days. Many young people consider themselves spiritual but not religious and do not attend church. Churches often lag, lag with cultural shifts and do not easily change their positions on the way of doing things. Churches often lack agility and are bound by traditions. Conflict over giving to missions versus meeting the operational needs of the church begin to arise. My church is an example. Founded in Founded 134 years ago with a mission towards social justice, our congregation of 600 now averages 100 in worship and 100 visiting through streaming. In the last two years, we have lost nine members of our congregation ages between 80 and 100. They've been the financial strength of the, of the church for a long, long time. And the new members who, are attracting, who we are attracting to our church are younger, they're motivated by our vision, but they have much fewer disposable assets. This year so far, we've only been able to pledge 72% of our budget. For the first time in history, we've not pledged our budget by this time of the year. We're in a pickle. And my church is one of the healthiest financial churches I know of. So what are nonprofits, especially churches, going to do to not only survive but thrive? In our work, we've encountered six common themes that hold back, thwart, and keep nonprofits from being top-performing, healthy organizations. One, a changing demographic. A changing demographic that is impacting uh, nonprofits in a powerful financial way. The 80 20 rule is now the 95 5 rule. 80% of your revenue comes from 20% of the people. Now it's 95% of your revenue comes from 5% of the people. This is true in every community in our country. 95% of the wealth in every community in our country is held by 5% of the people. Why? Because the middle class is going away. It's going away due to tax law changes, inflation is going away to the lack of affordable housing. It's going away for a lot of different reasons. And therefore, the focus in fundraising has to turn to high wealth individuals. And dealing with high wealth individuals is intimidating for those in the nonprofit sector, because 90% of the employees in the nonprofit sector come from lower to middle class families. Two, there is often a lack of employee honesty. Our firm believes that one of the biggest problems at every Christian nonprofit that we've worked with is the lack of honesty. The lack of honesty becomes there are so many managers who are hesitant to give direct feedback to their employees' performances for fear of hurting someone's feelings, thus producing mediocre employees and mediocre results and unaddressed conflicts. Three, too many nonprofit leaders focus on needs rather than vision. It's quite clear that high wealth individuals give to vision that does not put band-aids on problems, but solves them. Many nonprofits still only talk about the needs of their organizations rather than their visions that produce a ripple about outcomes for their clients and the world. Four, in Dan, in Dan Sullivan's work, his research, most nonprofits are captured by what he calls the attitude of bondage instead of the freedom of joy. Or another way to say it, the attitude of scarcity 
instead of one of abundance. They focus on expenses rather than investments. Five, what we hear from many of our clients that keeps them from becoming healthy, performing organizations is often this refrain, if only we had more money. And then six, the sixth reality is that excruciating fear of asking someone for money. With this as our background, I want to look at the first three F words. Faith, fear, and fundraising. First, faith. Every healthy nonprofit has at its core a purpose, a determination, a mission driven by what Simon Sinek calls the why. On your website, it's right up front. At Baylor's Truett Seminary, God called people are equipped for gospel ministry in and alongside Christ's church by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here, theological education is a sacred process of preparation for a kingdom's purpose. The why is the belief that if certain actions are taken, people, institutions, and organizations will be safer, healthier, more fulfilled and equipped to face life's challenges, and they will maximize the opportunities for the people they serve. What starts the engine for a nonprofit organization to be a top performer is having a faith, a belief, a why that is then translated into an audacious confidence that because I am here, under the leadership of God to fulfill his calling on my life, then I can have a faith that even though I cannot see the outcomes of all I do, I carry on with energy and with focus. I can have a faith in the belief that I will never walk alone in my journey. I can have a faith that the tools, the relationships, and the answers will sprinkle into my pathway through synchronicity, the simultaneous occurrence of events occurring significantly related, but they do not have a discernible casual connection. Hmm. Such as a new college president reading in the first days in his office and coming across Proverbs 327. Or a speaker showing up at a campus and spending time and discovering new possibilities, or even a person who happens to sit next to you on an airplane. By chance, a young George Truett was at a meeting as a teenager when he heard his school superintendent, Mr. Finger, give a one-hour lecture. Truett described it as fun and full of much practical information later in his life saying, that chance hour influenced the rest of my life. Our team has found that many of our faith-based clients populate the workforce with people that are there for jobs, not a calling. The why is not reflected on the pictures on their walls. The testimonies of lives impacted are not shared in their staff meetings. And the conversations about the water fountain often are more about gossip than about vision. The power of the Holy Spirit is often forfeited in Christian nonprofits. In 1979, I went through a tragedy that brought me to my knees. I was in the last year of my DMIN program. I was pastoring a First Baptist Church in the counter seat town I was a father of three wonderful daughters, eight, five, and two. Early on a beautiful May morning, I received my doctor of ministry degree. That night after the girls were in bed, my wife told me she was leaving, filing for a divorce, and taking the girls with her. The next day, a moving truck pulled up at our house, and they moved 200 miles away. The next six months were hellish. I cried myself to sleep every night. The church was wonderful. 
and they stood by my side. My parents and my siblings stayed in touch, trying to rally me to keep my footing. One night, my mother called, and she said to me, hey, Bill, you're going to get through this. The girls are going to be fine because you're always going to be a wonderful dad. And you're going to have a story to tell. And my son, you have a special power by your side. She then paraphrased a verse I heard repeatedly at our church from the WMU. Acts 1.8. If you'll be my witness, she paraphrased again. In other words, son, if you'll tell your story about God's impact on your life through this experience, you shall receive a power from the Holy Spirit that will allow you to impact lives everywhere you go for the rest of your life. You and I in this place and Christian nonprofits have a power that is available to us every day that strengthens us with a faith, the belief in the things we cannot see, that should infuse us with a confidence to fight any enemy, any problem, or any challenge. King Saul, speaking to the young David, said, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are a youth, and he's a man of war from his youth. Oh, but King David, I have a story to tell. I have killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. The great advantage of Christian nonprofits is the power of the Holy Spirit. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his first book in 1957 called Striving for Freedom that the Spirit of God is the continuing community building force to move history. Let me say that again. The Spirit of God is the continuing community building force to move history. In the fourth chapter of Luke, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Recently, my church started a theologian in residence program. Reverend Dr. James Forbes, former pastor of the Riverside Baptist Church in New York, is now our associate pastor. And on Martin Luther King Day, he preached, and he quoted Dr. Dr. King, saying, When we are called or anointed to be ministers of the gospel, we don't just breathe in oxygen, but we breathe in the Spirit of God. And continuing, Dr. King says, the anointed ones always have by themselves a cosmic companion. Dr. Rick Davis is here today. Dr. Davis has pastored three significant churches in Texas from Middle Lothian, Brownwood, and Brock. And in between, he served as the director of the Center for Strategic Evangelism of the Baptist General Convention of Texas. The cosmic companion the Spirit of God led him in December 2016 to become the executive director of the Chains of Grace Reentry Ministry, a place that provides reentry supervision for men and women coming out of long term incarceration. They have drug offenders, murderers, burglars, and violent criminals in their program. They are a Christ centered, privately funded reentry ministry. From the security of working for a denomination to the role of risking running a Christian nonprofit, Rick Davis said, here I am. And by faith, he took the leap. But there's another F word, perhaps the most difficult F word of all. <clears throat> it gets in the way of the cosmic companion all the time. It's called fear. It is fear that often stops us from becoming all we can be, from applying Christianity to the fullness of which it is intended. B.H. Carroll and the young minister, George Truett, were together on a fundraising tour. 
They did a lot of that together. The crowd was very small. Truett suggested to Dr. Carroll that because of the small size, they not take up an offering that night. Carroll responded, Never take counsel of your fears or appearances. Do your holy duty, and you may unfearingly leave the result of God. Certainly, Mr. Truett, you will ask the people to present their money tonight. Truett, speaking of B.H. Carroll later in life, said that every great epic in history begins with the incarnation of a great ideal from a courageous leader. At birth, we all entered the world with fear being a part of who we are. Meg Foley, who is the Director of Performance Psychology for Bright Dot, has educated our team a great deal about how the brain operates. I'm sure you all know that there are three automatic responses that we have when we feel we are frightened. Flight, fight, or freeze. All these responses keep us from moving forward. Amy Battle says that fear makes us small. Worst of all, we lose minutes, hours, and days of precious life in joy-filled circumstances. What if we were pushed by our fears to new levels of performance, she asked. Lucy Daniels, a psychologist and a member of my church who spent five years as a teenager in a mental institution, writes that at age 88, that our problems can become our greatest opportunities. We have found that nonprofits operate in the freeze response way too often. They're not analyzing data. They're not willing to change. They've not developed operational systems that, they re that will rely on routine, routines instead of emotions. They easily find excuses for failed results. They recruit board members that do not have clear expectations or who do not want to be held accountable. They accept mediocre performance from employees instead of providing opportunities for personal growth. They do not build relationships and follow up with solicitations. They, they complain about the lack of engagement of their boards. They are not transparent in communicating with their staff. In most cases, if they ask for money, they always ask for too little. In 2006, the Educational Advisory Board in Washington, D.C. commissioned a study on the difference between an average fundraiser and a superior fundraiser. The re results were clear. The difference was the level of one's emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence particularly comes down to three things, self-knowledge, managing your emotions, and understanding other people. If you have high degrees of emotional intelligence, you do not flee, you do not freeze, you do not fight when faced with a challenge, but you respond by moving through your fear. As we help nonprofits start recruiting employees to their institutions, we don't care about the previous work experiences. We're much more focused on are they resilient? Are they persistent? Do they have a positive attitude? Are they creative? And does their personal why match the why of the organization they're going to go to work for? This is, this is the bread and butter of emotional intelligence. And I would suggest to you today, it is, the, it is what makes applied Christianity work in our world. Resilience is important. As we begin talking with potential clients, and, and helping them employ new people. Our performance psychologist, Meg Foley, has told us, find out about their childhoods. People who've been through a childhood drama tend to be, whether it's death, divorce, relocation, targeted bullying, the chances are that they will be much more resilient and persistent in the workplace. We want our clients to hire people who have experienced success, overcome setbacks, and find ways to get through challenges. Truett Cathy, when he founded Chick-fil-A, and by the way, Truett Cathy was named after George Truett, says it's easier to be a success than a failure. 
Employees can be taught a skill, but they can't be taught resilience and persistence. So we apply our Christian lives. Fear does not have to defeat us. Confidence can lead us through it. But this leads us to our other F word, probably the most dreaded F word. Matter of fact, some of you might call this the profanity F word, fundraising. It does not matter what, where you look to find out what it is that scares people the most. At the top of the list is usually these three, death, public speaking, and asking somebody for money. Nonprofits need revenue. The philanthropic landscape of 2022 makes it clear that money's not the issue. Listen to this, since, since the year 2019, philanthropy giving has gone up 7% in this country, including during the pandemic. But donor numbers are going down. Affluent donors are dominating gift giving. High wealth families have grown from 2.6 million families in 2008 to 6.98 million families in 2021. In fact, in the next 10 years, $68 trillion is going to be passed from one generation to the next. Money is not the issue. What's the problem? The problem is the donor connection it's not being relational, but still transactional. It starts with getting to know a donor's heart. Again, quoting George Truitt, win the people and they will cheerfully give you their money. I don't care about their money. I want to win their heart. As for stewardship within the church, Kevin Callahan over 20 years ago said that the professional pastor is over. The time has come for the missionary entrepreneur pastor to arrive. What does this mean? I, like many of you, have known the Grundy and Jean James type of missionaries. The James served 25 years in Chile at the Colego Baptisto Academy. Every day they were challenged to run the school, clean the gym, steer the soup, repair uniforms, find transportation, employ faculty, staff the infirmary, and all the while, all the while finding ways to produce revenue, to keep the lights burning, the heat on, and cultivate donors to provide scholarships. Entrepreneurs is what the leaders of Christian nonprofits and pastors must be for the future. I grew up surrounded by preachers. My grandfather, a graduate of Southwestern, life was dominated by relations of pastors of all, by relationships with pastors of all church sizes. In my senior year in high school, he gave me the chance to go to the Baptist World Alliance in Tokyo, and my job was to retake the, the suitcases from the bus into the hotel way before there were wheels on suitcases. Hmm? And guess who was on the trip? 20 pastors and their wives. My dad was pastor of a, a large church in North Carolina. And every year, our vacation, guess where we went? The Southern Baptist Convention. And guess who was there? Preachers. I spent eight years getting my MDiv and my Doctor of Ministry, and I played a lot of intramural basketball in the gyms at the seminary. And guess who I was playing against? Wanna be preachers. Everywhere I turned, the conversations, whether on a plane, in a conversation, or playing intramural, were about the three B's budgets, buildings, and baptisms. And I was always curious as a young seminarian why it is that God always calls pastors to churches where the bees are bigger. Hmm. In the educational advisory study I referred to earlier, it says that the great fundraisers are enterprising, creative, and love to serve people. Could it be that the future of ministry in the Christian nonprofit world is going to be made up of the F words instead of the B words? There are two kinds of Christians, two kinds of Christian lay people. Those who have the gift to serve and those who have been gifted with the resources to give to the people who serve. 
George Truitt. Quote, We must show our men and women who have money, which is a God-given thing, and have the ability to get money, which is a God-given thing, that every one of them is only a rag picker if they do not use the money as a trustee of Jesus Christ. And here's the biggest reason, here's the biggest problem. The number one reason people do not give their money to an organization is they want to ask. And what does it take to ask? Audacious confidence. And where does that come from? For a follower of Christ, it comes through the power of the Holy Spirit who pushes us out of our comfort zones. So as we march into 2023, it's now time to forget failing. Dr. Truett often quoted Benjamin Franklin. Quote, value time, for time is the stuff of which life is made. And over the gateway to the tomb of many a man and woman who have failed, might it be written that the cause of their failure in these two words, they dwaddled. To be in ministry in today's world will require entrepreneurship and execution. To achieve goals you have never achieved, you must start doing things you've never done. The lack of self-awareness, the lack of controlling our emotions, the lack of not being resilient are the things that will hold us back. Believe me, money is not the problem. Remember, there is more money in circulation than there have ever been. The formula for healthy nonprofits is the ability to execute. For leaders to put in motion these things. What must a Christian nonprofit leader do? You must be flexible. You're the pastor of an old church with empty rooms. Tear down part of your structure and turn the land into a community garden. Less maintenance costs, more community impact. Turn over your fellowship hall and kitchen for free during the week for a minority family to start a restaurant open on Mondays and Fridays. Give it back to you, the church for the weekend and they pay a tithe of their profits. Collect clothes, but not for a nonprofit that packages the clothes and sends them to Africa, deny, Africa and denies African seamstress jobs, but that gives the clothes to those around you. And in here in Texas, there are a thousand on the border who need your help. Convert a church bus or van into mobile showers that you drive around the community offering warm showers to the homeless. Solicit sponsors to pay for one month of the gas and the water bills so that you can impact the lives of others. The entrepreneur church leader understands that donors give more money to, to restricted causes and unrestricted causes and therefore changes the way they do their budgeting. This is the missionary entrepreneur and leader of the future. Remember the words of George Truett. There are two kinds of laypersons, those that will serve and those that have the resources to fund them. And it's God's design that they work together. Then ultimately, the leader must execute. Martin Luther King challenges us one more time. If you can't fly, then run. If you cannot run, then walk. If you cannot walk, then crawl. Whatever you do, keep moving forward. Faith, fear, fundraising. I close with one more personal experience. My grandfather, Perry Crouch, who I mentioned earlier, called me in the midst of the personal tragedy that I ascribed to you, the divorce. He said, son, he always called me son when he was getting ready to tell me something really important. Go get a piece of paper and pencil, and I'm going to give you three things that I challenge you to execute the rest of your life. I figure it's going to be three Bible verses. No, this is what he said. Promise me the rest of your life you'll never leave your house in the morning unless your bed is made. Promise me for the rest of your life that you'll never leave your house in the morning unless all the dishes in the sink are washed, even if you're not the ones who dirtied them. Promise me that for the rest of your life, you'll never leave the house in the morning unless your shoes are shined and you look like a million dollars. 
He went on to say, I'm sharing this with you, son, because there will come times in your life when you are frightened, feeling shameful, disappointed, and depressed. It happens to all of us. But if you'll do these three things, that when you leave the house in the morning, you will have executed three small victories that 98% of the people you will see that day have not done. He says execution builds success, and success builds confidence. Fear, shame, and depression are erased by confidence and the acknowledgement that whatever the day might deal you, he is God and you are not. Forgets failing, son, and go make a difference in the world. I listened. My grandfather buried two of his sons in their 40s. He had a story to tell. And I was listening. For 43 years now, I have executed all three of those things every day. Joseph, Joseph Campbell says that the cave we fear to enter holds the treasures we seek. What cave are you not entering? Oh, and by the way, when I left the hotel this morning, my bed was made and my shoes were shined. God bless you.